thank you very much for being here. Even though the memes you were reviewing for our history of being lit, I still appreciate seeing you here. And may I wish you the happiest Groundhog Day. For those who do not keep up on current events, both Phil and Dave saw their show. Uh, yep. yep. <laughs> I promise this will be uh, well under an hour and happily take questions afterwards. I have one polite request. I would rather not we get into a discussion about Confederate battle flags and inappropriate take. Been there, done that. Um, let's have a chat about history instead. Um, enough said. Let's put some people to sleep. <laughs> In a well known article from 1906, John Philip Sousa expressed his dissatisfaction with the new recording technologies. Sousa was already suspicious of recorded sound that it was inferior to live music, and that it would eventually displace musicians from their livelihood. At this point, however, he comes at it a different way. The nightmare he imagined was an a, a army nobly marching to war with a car with a phonograph machine strapped onto the hood. This was dehumanizing, a machine leading soldiers to battle? Well, his perspective is informative. And the cartoon is pretty dang funny. What catches my eye is not the tension between live and recorded music, but the list of patriotic anthems he offered. We can understand why he would mention his own march, but why include what we might call a folk tune, the girl I left behind me? Even more curious, why does Sousa name Dixie, the unofficial anthem of the Confederacy, and not the Battle Hymn of the Republic or the Battle Cry of Freedom. Didn't the North win the Civil War? How is it that the March King, the face and sound of American patriotism, names a Confederate war song and a 19th century folk tune as American patriotic anthems? What the heck happened between the end of the Civil War and the turn of the century that led to this? That is what I hope to answer tonight. At the risk of stating the obvious, Reconstruction, the period following the Civil War, was a distressing episode for the United States, a failed attempt to heal self-inflicted wounds that resonates and even defines this country up to this day. Historians such as Nina Silber, David Blight, and Carolyn Janey have convincingly exposed the regional partisanship, racial politics, and capitalistic greed that worked against attempts at unity and equality. Trapped between these contentious forces were the songs made popular during the war. Battle Hymn, Dixie, and similar works had reached unprecedented heights of popularity that declined only slightly after the war, then grew more ferocious by the turn of the century when they were transformed into American patriotic anthems. This was not an easy process. For aesthetic appeal to eclipse political division, Listeners had to loosen or at least redirect any animosity associated with these pieces. This required a distancing from the politics behind the war and the reshaping of memories, a process of selective forgiveness that was neither smooth nor predictable. Now, while some might think that accepting Union and Confederate war songs was a logical result of Reconstruction, I would strongly disagree. To begin with, Reconstruction failed in more ways than I can relate here tonight. But more importantly, I will argue that the acceptance of Civil War songs as American patriotic songs happened before the country found reunion. In fact, I believe it was a major step towards reconciliation. This evolution created a number of problems along the way. Indeed, once a canon of American patriotic music was established, subsequent generations were caught in a pickle. Late 19th century and early 20th century critics, many of whom had no personal experience with the Civil War, 
now had to explain, justify, or dismiss pieces that were already considered classics, a process that was complicated by authorial bias, including geography, age, racial politics, and last but certainly not least, personal taste. An examination of antebellum critiques of Maryland My Maryland will serve as a case study of this disorderly process. So, onward and upward. Time does not permit an overview of Reconstruction and the countless political slugfests that arose as a result. To simplify and paraphrase, post-bellum America faced what turned out to be three competing agendas, Reconstruction, Reconciliation, and Reunion. Reconstruction sought to heal the material wounds of war and to balance economic and political inequities between the North and South following abolition. This included passing the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments and economic and industrial modernization. Reconciliation required finding a middle ground between the previous enemies that relied on moral relativism to enable acceptance and forgiveness. Reunion was the ideological goal wherein the country would once again stand united. Altogether, an ambitious and worthy plan perhaps, but doomed to fail. Social and economic reforms failed to take root during Reconstruction, while unresolved issues and latent tension impeded reconciliation. Most citizens realized that reunion of some kind was necessary as the century drew to a close. So various interests chose to ignore unsavory developments, accept compromises, and dismiss many of the objectives that had defined the reform movement. In other words, moral resolution was sacrificed in favor of sectional reconciliation, which then allowed for political reunion. It was during this time that the movement we call the Lost Cause took root, when many Southerners reframed the war as the war of Northern aggression, pushing slavery to the background and eventually enabling the passing of Jim Crow laws. So, how did Civil War songs successfully chart their own course through this political swamp and end up top of the hip parade? Let me introduce our protagonist tonight, the one demographic of Victorian America that is inseparable from patriotic music, Civil War veterans. While there has been a great deal of scholarship on Civil War vets, little attention has been given to how much they shaped cultural standards in the decades following the war. I suggest that understanding veteran subculture is the only way to understand how certain types of music evolved up to the 20th century. At the end of the Civil War, an astonishing three and a half million veterans, over 11% of the population, put down their guns and returned home. At first, most were happy to put the war behind them and pick up their lives from before. In 1866, the first major veterans organization was founded in the North, the Grand Army of the Republic, otherwise known as the GAR. It did not do well recruiting members and struggled financially for the next decade. There was no equivalent in the South, though some veterans held reunions based around the region they lived or the units they had fought with. Then came the presidential election of 1868, when Ulysses S. Grant defeated Horatio Seymour. It became apparent to anybody paying attention that veterans and their concerns were a major factor at the polls. Needless to say, music was a huge part of these campaigns, and the songs that had led Yankee against Rebel now found new purpose as former opponents began to share political goals. Slowly, the GAR began to grow, turning its attention to those suffering the after effects of the war and lobbying for state homes for veterans and war orphans, as well as pensions for the wounded. Reunions, large and small, what came to be called campfires, became immensely popular, a chance for veterans to gather with old comrades, sing songs, and tell stories. The political power of veterans continued to grow as well. In the South, local governments were beginning to feel the impact of veteran opinion, as former Confederate soldiers were granted a priority right to public office. 
By the late 1870s, veterans were pouring into elected positions. During the 45th Congress, 1877, former Confederate states sent 95 members to the House and Senate, of whom 70% were veterans. The prominence and power of these veteran politicians cannot be overestimated. Consider this. Only one name up here on this list was not a Civil War vet. Forget Roosevelt. Um, all these campaigns, in addition, used the war in some way. Ulysses S. Grant is obvious. Hayes, Rutherford B. Hayes, really pushed his war record. In fact, so much so that his opponents began to use it against him. Arthur and Harrison made veteran concerns a central part of their platforms. And even Roosevelt, though not a vet, uh, used the memory of the war and veterans to rile up the country before and after the Spanish-American War. And, and it goes without saying at this point, all of these elections drew on Civil War songs for their campaign songs. The political power of veterans, what became the largest lobbying force the country would ever see, was but one aspect of the country's response to the Civil War. For example, there was a growing interest in, the, in memorializing the fallen, as well as glorifying and then mythologizing the war. The honoring of those who died during the war became an emotional focal point for both northern and southern communities, and the decorating of graves would lead to the founding of Memorial Day. By the 1880s, Civil War veterans were in their mid-40s, occupying key roles in business, politics, the arts, in short, in every walk of life. It was also at this time that much of the animosity that had lain behind the surface for two decades began to dissipate to some degree. Perhaps the war was far enough behind that soldiers could look back with a softened memory. Or perhaps these former soldiers found they had more in common with each other and less with the rapidly changing country around them. There was a surge of published reminiscence and regimental histories, though now they were surprisingly objective. Authors tended to valorize all the combatants, and rarely do you read negative comments about their opponents. Veterans organizations blossomed as a result of this new memorializing and mythologizing. The GAR went from an enrollment of 30,000 in 1878 to an amazing 320,000 in 1887, less than 10 years. New organizations, including women's auxiliaries and sons of veterans, began to appear. The Century Magazine began to publish its Battles and Leaders in 1884, an extremely popular and widely read series of articles, reminiscence, and editorials written by both Northern and Southern Civil War veterans. Generally speaking, this process of glorification boosted the veterans' view of themselves at the same time it promoted their status on the larger social stage. Southern veterans, probably weary of getting the short stick in regional politics, finally matched their Northern counterparts by founding the United Confederate Veterans in 1889. The organization grew quickly, reaching a peak enrollment of about 80,000 members in 1903. By 1890, the glorification of the war in print and in public celebrations had swept the nation. GAR membership, membership peaked that year at over 420,000 members. Veterans across the country had bonded directly and indirectly into a subculture capable of shaping politics, culture, and public memory. This veteran community was surprisingly inclusive. African-American veterans were active in post-war celebrations and established their own branches of the GAR. More notable, however, is the number of integrated posts that emerged. While egalitarianism amongst these veterans was not universal, these men were much more willing to support their previous comrades in arms. In the eyes of many, service to one's country trumped racial difference. Sadly, this camaraderie did not extend to Native American veterans. 
few of the tribes who joined the Union or Confederate armies found cause to celebrate or commemorate the war. The death toll among already small populations, the destruction of tribal lands, and the resulting displacement of families, that was bad enough. But the failure to secure any social or legal gains after the war led many tribes to avoid commemorating the war in any way. And if you are to visit any of the reservations or uh, uh, museums or whatnot uh, hosted by the tribes, they still ignore the war. They flat out ignore it. So the stage is set. We have our leading actors in place. Now it remains to see how music factored in. One common thread in post-war narratives is the restructuring of institutional memory through the mythologizing of the war and the commemoration of its soldiers. Immediately after the war, Confederates had been praised for defending their states and the South's way of life, while Union veterans were praised for fighting to restore the Union and abolish slavery. Over the years, attention shifted away from such political motivations to be replaced with the valorization of all who fought in the war. Veteran com commemoration became a nationwide passion, but it was the courage of American soldiers that was celebrated, not rebels or Yankees. It was these redefined veterans that are key to understanding what happened to Civil War music in the last half of the 19th century. I submit it was the emergence of this veteran subculture, distinct from and prior to the rise of sectional reconciliation that rehabilitated music and transformed antagonistic songs into patriotic anthems. Key to this process was the often uneasy alliance between aesthetics and politics. The success of Civil War songs must be understood as balancing musical attraction with latent or imposed social function. Some of these pieces ideally represented opposing politics. Others had nothing to do with the war, but were really great tunes that were extremely popular. Over time, this music coalesced into a unified body of literature, so much so that all Civil War songs, regardless of their lyrical intent or political baggage, became emblems of the American spirit. Now, implicit in my argument so far is that the reconciliation that occurred involved veterans and their music, not civilians. This distinction is important and based on two premises. First is what James Deal called front ideology. This refers to the social gap that emerges between those who fought in a war and those who did not. <coughs> Excuse me, the trauma of combat often leads soldiers to empathize more with each other than with those who cannot understand what they experienced or who chose not to enlist. This perspective underlays much of the development of Civil War veteran culture. Second, the music itself, which means we get to take a moment and play a game. Name that tune. I see heads nodding. I can see your smiles behind the masks. People are saying, I know this one. I'm going to finally pass music history. <laughs> Y'all are going to say, ask Battle Hymn of the Republic. And you know what I'm going to say? <laughs> well, you know, no, not quite. I'll give you 50% credit. Let me tell you a quick story if you don't know this. At the start of the war, the members of uh, the Massachusetts militia were gathering in Boston. And as groups came together, various battalions were then attached to regiments and sent to the front. There was one battalion nicknamed the Tiger Battalion. 
who would eventually be assigned to the 12th Massachusetts Infantry. They had among their ranks a rather talented musical type who was also a rapscallion of some sort. He thought his regiment needed a marching tune. That's what they needed, right? So he picked a pre-existing tune, uh, a very well-known and popular religious tune, a camp, uh, camp meeting song called uh, Say Brothers, Will You Meet Us at Canaan's Happy Shore. He picked that tune, because everybody knew it, and then he wrote a set of new lyrics over it. And these lyrics did two things at one time. They made reference to the abolitionist John Brown, who by this point had already tried to seize the arsenal at Harper's Ferry. But they also had a sergeant in the regiment by the name of John Brown, who they liked to poke fun at. So this lyric is this weird hodgepodge of, of just silly imagery and whatnot. Well, he taught it to his buddies in the battalion. They loved it. They started singing it when they marched. They hooked up with the 12th Massachusetts Regiment. They loved it, and everybody started to sing it. They bumped into other regiments from Massachusetts. They loved it. You see where I'm going with this. Every regiment that ran into this loved this song. I'm not exaggerating when I say within six months, half the stinking Union Army is singing this song while they're marching. John Brown's body. One of those regiments is marching down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., and they pass underneath a hotel window. Uh, and in that room is Julia Ward Howe. She sees the soldiers marching, she hears them singing this song, and she's struck by the tune. That night, she goes to sleep and has these incredible, dramatic, vivid dreams. She wakes up in the middle of the night and literally in one setting, boom, 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 writes down a set of lyrics to the marching tune she'd heard. She sent that off to the Atlantic Monthly. They quickly published it under the title, The Battle Hymn of the Republic. And that, as they say, is that. A, a, an American classic is born. So I set you up for failure. If I had asked the same question of an audience in the year 1864, I would have gotten two different answers from the audience. Half of them would have said battle him. Half of them would have said John Brown's body. What's the difference? The first half would have been northern civilians. They would have said battle him. Soldiers, Union and Confederate, would have said, oh no, that tune, that's John Brown's body. What's my point? Pieces of music are not concrete artifacts. They are social activities that involve listeners, performers, the setting, and so on. In a study like mine, you have to be really careful not to distort historical perceptions. What I am hearing may not have been what they were hearing. Give you a trickier example. First one. Hear your country call you up lest worse than death befall you to arms, to arms, to arms in Dixie. So you say once again, well, the three things I just played, the same melody? Yeah. But I submit to you, they're three different pieces of music. The first is a military march performed by a military band, by soldiers, for soldiers. It's a functional piece of music. The second is a folk tune, derives back from minstrelsy. By this point, it's what we would almost call a pop tune. Bunch of people sitting around a fire singing it for their own entertainment. The third one is a domestic parlor ballad, sung by a civilian, accompanied by a civilian instrument. In short, there is no one piece known as Dixie, or Battle Hymn, or John Brown's Body. Who was listening to a piece at a certain time and place was often more important than the notes that make up the experience of that piece. For me, the best example of this is in regimental bands playing Dixie. 
there are countless references to Union bands playing Dixie. And this absolutely drives Civil War historians nuts. They do not know how to explain this. And many of them have tried to say, oh, yeah. and they got the title wrong, it's a different piece. No, they're playing Dixie. But you can't just look at what they were hearing. You need to ask how these people were listening. Many, if not most, soldiers would not hear a rebel song. They heard a military march performed by a military band. Dixie, played by either a Union or Confederate band in the middle of a campaign, represented the military community more than it did a socio-political entity known as the Confederacy. Now that being said, if there was a Northern civilian witnessing the same performance, they very likely would have heard the song Dixie, as that's what they're familiar with, and it would have included the lyrics and clearly marked it as Southern. For the civilian, the band is an exotic ensemble. It's not part of their lived reality. The band sounds like soldiers in the field, whereas the piano sounds like a parlor at home. These are the factors that shape the reception and meaning of a song. Now, I think you can see how this perspective would manifest in later years. For soldiers, it's a fairly short step to accept your former opponent's music. For civilians, it's a huge, huge leap. Dixie and John Brown's body would always represent South and North to some degree. But for veterans, these songs represented the military community as much, if not more, than the political community. Music was inseparable from the veterans' evolving communal identity from the start. In fact, the first commercial collections of war songs came out during the war. Taking song collections and commentaries as a whole, you can see a slow shift in attitude from 1860 to 1900 that parallels and supports the rise of a bipartisan veteran subculture. Initially, the music is segregated north and south, and the predictable animosity taints any discussion. Yet even at this point, there are signs of the bipartisanship to come. Hostility then gives way to a more inclusive treatment of the songs, as emphasis is turned away from their original purpose. The popularity of these songs made them ideal for reuse in contemporary politics, and wartime connotations were pushed to the margins. Toward the end of the century, bipartisan collections dominate, and Union and Confederate songs are treated side by side as American anthems. At this point, a new generation of writers enters with little to no personal connection to the war, and they begin to critically examine what were now considered American patriotic songs. Now, as I mentioned earlier, these new anthems were not only a combination of Union and Confederate war songs, but included songs written and performed during the war that may have had nothing to do with the fighting. This is where you see the real power of Civil War song. And let me show you what I mean. Here's one example of a published collection that was so popular at the time. These usually have titles that situate the collection in relation to the war and its participants, which helps to establish Civil War songs as a unified, exclusive genre. Here is the table of contents. The first thing to note, it is clearly a union-heavy publication, so some bias remains. But even so, the Bonnie Blue Flag, the first Confederate anthem, is included. Then, if I remove the lesser known tunes, what remains is a list of extremely successful songs with demonstrated long-lasting musical appeal. This appeal was evident during the war by their popularity with both sides, and then by their subsequent reuse, either in their original form or as contrafact. If I then separate these songs by their content or function, what we find is an almost 50-50 split between military songs and domestic songs that speak of the home front or don't mention the war at all. Yet, all of them are published together, 
all of them are treated as songs of the soldiers or our great war songs. They are defined by their heritage, not their lyrical content. And they're retained because they're really well-liked tunes. So by the end of the century, all of these are viewed as monuments to the great watershed in American history, and thus, by default, as patriotic songs. Now, my argument so far is based off surviving material culture, specifically publications that include music. Published music is an invaluable primary source for musicologists, so long as its strengths and weaknesses are held in check. Commercial sheet music responds to previous and current popular taste. No publisher wants to invest in a publication if no one's going to buy it. So there has to be interest in music before publishers target. At the same time, these publications influence future taste. If the market favors a certain type of music, then subsequent listeners are steered in that direction. To retain some measure of ob objectivity, then, requires balancing material culture with musical practice. You need to take into account both what is being performed as well as what is being published. In the case of Civil War patriotic songs, this is somewhat harder to document, but the results are well worth it. What I learned was that public performances of Civil War songs paralleled the trend in publications. But there is more. What I learned was that the practice often anticipated the publication. In other words, the acceptance of Northern and Civil War songs in performance preceded bipartisan publications, in some cases by a significant amount of time. While this is not necessarily unheard of, it has a huge impact on my thesis. Consider the annual meetings of the Society of the Army of Tennessee, a Union unit that fought in major battles from Fort Donald, uh, Henry and Donaldson all the way through the Atlanta campaign. The Society began meeting in 1866 and continued all the way through to the 1890s. It was common at such meetings for there to be a number of speeches and toasts interspersed with songs. OK, what were those songs? The first couple of meetings, the music was what you would expect. Hail Columbia, the Star Spangled Banner, marching through Georgia, and so on. Then comes the meeting from 1873. After the 12th toast, they sang John Brown's Body. Notice, they did not sing Battle Hymn, the civilian equivalent. Then what did they sing after the 13th toast? Would you look at that? Dixie, the supposed anthem of their recent enemies. Apparently this gathering didn't have a problem with the tune. And finally, what comes after the 14th toast? The girl I left behind me. So. Maybe Sousa's choice of patriotic songs doesn't seem so odd anymore. I remind you, this is 1873, only eight years after the end of the war. Within a decade of the surrender at Appomattox Courthouse, veterans had already started embracing all of this music as their music. And subsequent appearances of published collections with domestic and military songs from North and South presented together now it makes more sense. Then comes Memorial Day, parades, the 4th of July, all featuring a soundtrack comprised of Civil War tunes. What the veterans co-opted as symbols of their service were then cast before the general public as emblems of American patriotism. Now, having said all that, make no mistake, this was not a smooth process. Some veterans were unwilling to forgive their enemies and did not want to listen to the Bonnie Blue Flag or Dixie. More interesting, and if I can say more entertaining, is how civilians and later generations handled this literature. You find all kinds of praise, complaints, and justifications. Some are extremely passionate, some are downright silly. But altogether, they reveal the complexities surrounding the study of popular music, patriotism, 
and institutional memory. These critiques also serve as a reminder that the Civil War may not have ended at Appomattox Courthouse. Now, to give you some details of the progression, I'll give you a brief reception history of the song Maryland My Maryland, one of the most inflammatory yet successful songs from the war. The Real quickly, um, in 1861, a group of soldiers, once again from Massachusetts, by the way, uh, were being transferred down south to the front. Uh, and they were being taken there by train, but the tracks did not run all the way from the north to the south, so they had to switch trains in Baltimore. So the troops disembarked on one station, and they were marching to another station to catch their next train. Halfway there, they ran into a mob of civilians southern sympathizing civilians. It started with harsh words, then rocks and bricks were thrown, and ultimately shots were fired. A number of civilians and a number of soldiers were killed in what became known as the Pratt Street Riot. As you can imagine, this was a flashpoint across the country, headlines everywhere, Union was outraged, the Confederacy was proud of the, the, uh, the, the, the support shown. Um, that's what this lyric details. Um, th it was originally written as a poem by a, a native Marylander who at the time was living in Louisiana. He heard about the riot. He had friends who were living at the time. He was very upset, just like Julia Ward Howe. He had a dream. He woke up in the middle of the night and he wrote a poem called My Maryland. He submitted it to a local paper. They published it, proved very successful. And as was common back then, newspapers subsequently reprint each other's pieces. So his poem went from newspaper to newspaper to newspaper. And literally within about three months, it had covered uh, most of the South and some of the North. Uh, two young sisters in Baltimore read the poem, found it inspiring. And one of them realized that the meter of the poem fit uh, the song you all know as Christmas Tree, O Christmas Tree. And so they set it to music, they made slight alterations, set it to music, uh, and took it to a local publisher who saw the value in it, published it, and within about two months after that, uh, one of the most popular Confederate anthems were, was born, Maryland and My Maryland. Uh, I, I tell you that story not only to give you background, but to show you how fast it happened. It's insanely fast for the time. Now, having said all that, my guess is that some of you found it a little odd that such a bloody and angry lyric would be set to a tune that you find so gentle and harmless. I mean, it's hard for us not to hear Christmas when you hear that melody. Rest assured, you are not alone. Um, as we will see, many critics had the same difficulty you did. But I would point out, it's usually civilian critics Soldiers had already grafted meaning onto the notes. So veteran writers, later years, they had no problem treating it as a military song. So <laughs> one of the first and positive evaluations of Maryland by Maryland came from the respected poet and physician, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr. Holmes granted that there were flaws in the poem, but it did not keep him from praising it in the highest terms. The success came at a price, however, and he questioned the impact such words had on a war fought for questionable principles. He pointed out that young ladies, quote, screamed this song as they sat at their pianos, close quote, driving young soldiers to feats of heroism only to die in defense of slavery. This lecture foreshadows the next 50 years of critical commentary. To begin with, Holmes separates the lyric from the music, though he alternates between the two if he's trying to make a point. 
Holmes is noteworthy in that he is one of the few to not ignore the ideology behind the anthem. That being said, credit is due in that he was willing to discuss the piece as an artwork despite its controversial creation. And yet, there was a personal bias. Clearly, Holmes disdained the screaming young ladies because they were supporting the wrong cause. No doubt he would applaud northern ladies who sang or screamed the battle cry of freedom as their men left for the front. Richard Grant White's poetry, The Civil War of 1866, was much less concerned with objectivity. His volume included songs from North and South, but his short commentaries leave no doubt to his political orientation. He snipes at Confederates and Peace Democrats alike. Two additional things to note. His praise for Maryland, my Maryland, is about as high as it can get. But you'll notice he, he makes reference to officers, have told me. Uh, he, was not a, he was not a veteran himself. A writer for the Cincinnati Daily Commercial was even less restrained in a critique of rebel lyrics in August of 1865. The paper had obtained a recently published pamphlet containing Southern war songs. And after perusing its contents, the editors decided that these songs proved basically why the Confederacy was a failure. Um, yeah, we think we have harsh critics today. Um, this list included, by the way, three different sets of lyrics to accompany Maryland, My Maryland. Now, one of the most interesting publications from the time of the war was Frank Moore's The Civil War in Song and Story, came out in 1866. This collection was remarkably inclusive and non-judgmental. In his preface, he explained that he selected pieces that were worthy of perpetuation. Moore was a historian as much as a journalist. His attitude towards music was one of the first signs of what was to come, that the war was seen as a turning point in American history and that its artifacts, including music, would become legendary. The next few years saw the publication of songsters, small collections, most of which favored one side or the other. Yet, by the supposed end of Reconstruction, um, patriotic tunes tended to be treated more symbolically and less personally their ideological baggage used to fuel contemporary political debates, not to rehash old arguments. For example, in the 1872 Democratic Convention, one observer claimed that the music most applauded by the delegates were Dixie and My Maryland. This infuriated a correspondent for the Dubuque Daily Times, who took particular offense at Maryland, My Maryland, calling it a war cry of, dis, uh, of disunion and a denunciation of Union soldiers. Okay, while true in the main, the rest of the article reveals the author's bias was less against the song and more against presidential candidate Horace Greeley. This rhetorical slant also explains why the writer ignored the primary reason that Maryland My Maryland received so much applause. The convention was held in Baltimore. Such diatribes were not the norm as the late 70s and early 80s saw a significant shift away from polemics towards praise. Here is where the mythologizing of the war sweeps up music in its restructuring of memories. In addition, personal preference now factors more into the discussion as post-war civilians start to rank the best patriotic songs. For example, in 1883, The Young Folk's History of the Civil War was published, a clearly Southern work that shows the early stages of lost cause rhetoric. Randall's anthem got a brief mention when the author claimed that Maryland was one of the prettiest war songs. A curious choice of words for a war song, to say the least, especially when compared with other discussions, such as Francis Brown's Bugle Echoes of 1886. Brown ranked Maryland by Maryland extremely high, but for the very opposite reason. Quote, this poem is probably the most famous, as it is the most stirring in its martial tone of all the war evoked, close quote. This last passage raises another issue. Notice that Brown claimed the poem to be stirring, yet what, what was evoked was now a memory. 
The ground is being laid for the transfer of function. Maryland by Maryland's past effectiveness as a war song is what makes it a convincing patriotic song for later generations. A seismic shift occurred with the publication of Our War Songs North and South in 1887. This book sold extremely well and became the standard reference for years to come. Brainerd, the book's publisher, put out full page promo in their magazine and ads and reviews can be found in newspapers throughout the country. A look at the cover says it all. Two soldiers in blue and gray shaking hands, though you will notice the Confederate flag is not present. But the message is clear. Veterans stand united, the heroes of our past, and this was their music. Curiously, Maryland My Maryland was not treated as a major hit by Brainerd. In fact, it's pretty easy to see he did not like the tune at all. Instead, he offers an odd description that provides a curious defense for the song's bipartisan appeal. After pointing out that the words were set to an old German tune, he then noted that the song was even popular with Northerners who perhaps sang it without knowing its meaning. Now, this stands as one of the most ridiculous claims I have ever encountered. I find it hard to imagine that anyone, North or South, missed the meaning of the despot's heel and the tyrant's chains. Brainerd is serving as an apologist here. Maryland, My Maryland was already acknowledged as a major anthem. A lot of people really liked the song. Some praised the poem. So he had to include it, even though the lyric is, by definition, treasonous. By this point, Civil War songs had reached their patriotic apotheosis. There was little effort to justify their place in history, and they were, for the most part, accepted as iconic American war songs. Having attained this security, they were now evaluated artistically and supposedly apolitically by a new generation of civilians with no ties to the war. One of the most common strategies at this point was a return to Oliver Wendell Holmes' approach of separating the lyric from the tune. No great war song was ever written by a distinguished poet, claimed Rossiter Johnson in 1894. Though, if we consider Maryland by Maryland as a poem, it is the best. So, apparently Randall is not a great poet, but the poetry for this song is the best of the bunch, so long as we don't consider it a song lyric. Go figure. In 1910, a writer for the Bookman brushes aside Randall's stature as a poet, claiming that My Maryland was his only poem that had any real interest, either literary or historical. It is the music, rather than the words, that give life to the composition, this writer observed. Randall was lucky to have a catchy tune for his poem, since his words were sometimes good and sometimes rather crude. J. Hubble, in his 1922 introduction to poetry, disagrees. The poem, in fact, has a superb fire and power to which the air scarcely does justice. I think you realize by now, at this point, these arguments have devolved into personal taste dressed up as highbrow criticism. There's no longer any personal connection to the song. It's a historical artifact. Those who elevated the piece are fading away. By 1920, there's maybe 50,000 surviving veterans. By 1940, the number has dwindled to 10,000. Then comes World War II, Vietnam and Korea, the Civil Rights Movement. It's a brave new world that no longer has a place for Civil War veterans and their memories. A musical legacy that had lasted 150 years is set aside for a new generation of listeners and their music. Civil War songs contributed to and benefited from the restructuring of memory and the mythologizing of the war. By the start of the century, they had secured a place in the cultural identity of this country. Neither individual taste nor negative evaluations could change this, as Battle Hymn of the Republic, Dixie, and even Maryland My Maryland had already moved beyond politics to become icons. 
You might say that Civil War songs achieved what politics could not. They softened memories for the war survivors, they were positive contributors to reconciliation, and they achieved reunion for a portion of the country long before the turn of the century. While the title of my presentation tonight was Reconstructing Songs, perhaps I should have said it was Songs Reconstructing the Country. Thank you very much. I would love it if anybody has any questions. And if nobody does, then we'll talk about Confederate battle flags, but I really don't. Yes? I'm curious as to what sparked this research for, for like, your personal. Uh, what, I'm sorry, I'm curious as to what. No, no, I heard you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the debate and making up a really good answer or telling the truth. <laughs> when I got into this area of research, I swore upside down I was never going to do two things. I was never going to study songs. I was totally into bands, soldiers. I was so focused on that. Military music, enlisted music, that was all. I did not want to touch songs. They're, they're a landmine. You want to guess what the second thing I swore I would never study? Veterans. I said, I no interest in veteran culture. Man, I'm interested in the war. Um, I was attracted to military history from a very young age, but I ended up pursuing musicology for any number of reasons. Uh, it was a somewhat late epiphany, and it happened here at Fredonia. Professor Holcomb might even remember uh, when I literally, I almost stumbled into the field. When I realized that I could combine two loves of my life into, into one, and it just so happened, I accidentally found uh, a collection of letters by a Civil War band leader that nobody knew about. And that was the end of it. From there on out, that was the end of it. Uh, I've been doing it now for over 25 years. Uh, yes? Maybe, yeah, this may have a simple answer, or may not. <laughs> As a wrap up, I'll tell you that. So uh, each. Uh, it may be just that each war, each war has its own veterans and they have their own set of songs that are meaningful to them. But it does seem like these songs lasted well into the 20th century. I remember these songs, some of these songs, even when we were kids, via, you know, cartoons, <laughs> especially, you know, things like that. But there was something, even when we were kids, uh, these were portrayed as patriotic anthems. Then, you know, uh, in the Vietnam War, maybe we have, uh, you know, rock tunes suddenly, Creedence Clearwater Revival or something. Those are patriotic uh, kind of anthems. Are, what are the patriotic anthems now? Or are, do we have patriotic anthems? Are they, can we have? In terms of modern ones, you're going to have to go to Nashville, you know, Lee Greenwood and tunes like that. Um, to go back to the first half, uh, I would suggest there are three reasons why Civil War tunes held on, uh, held on as long as they did. The first is what I presented tonight. The second is... I don't know if you all know this, but the last Civil War veterans died in the, what, 1951? They were ridiculously long-lived. And some people have talked about this. Nobody's dug into it entirely. But if, if you know anything about Civil War combat, it was horrible. N n poor food, bad weather, no, you know, it was hor Yet these veterans lived an insanely long life. So that culture, that mentality, their music, I think, extends longer than most wars. Third thing, and this is where I'm going to get in trouble, but I'm just going to say it. I think in the 1860s, there were some really dang good songwriters floating around. 
you know, what are you going to do? I mean, tunes like um, Battle Cry of Freedom or Tenting on the Old Town, these, these are really well-crafted songs um, that I, I think their they're, they're innate quality uh, to a degree gives them that kind of longevity. To answer the second half, which is sort of answering the first half. If I stood up here and asked everybody, and this is not a trick question, you know, name me three Civil War tunes. Most people could do it. What if I said to this room, name me your favorite Mexican-American war song? But it gets worse. What if I say, name me your favorite Spanish-American war? Nothing. Those wars don't hold the place in the American psyche that the Civil War does. There are tunes from the Spanish-American War, by the way. Um, uh, Hot Time in the Old Time Tonight. Everybody knows that tune. But nobody associates it with the Spanish-American War. It separated itself from its own uh, war. Um, does that help somewhat, Gordon? Yeah. yeah. And it's a great question because obviously I'm, it, it's been keeping me up late at night. Julie. I had a question um, about uh, publishers, and what struck me is the first time I heard you use the word publisher was about the young ladies who had mm -hmm. sent Marilyn, uh, Marilyn to the old oh, Christmas tree. And, and then I'm noticing in your last images that here we have now in Maryland with multiple publishers, and that this may be a whole lecture of its own, but I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about how that either the development of a business community or the influence of people to purchase things or have, even have music publishers adjusted that over time or if somehow the need to have this music helps to create a business. Absolutely. Both. Both. It was a symbiotic relationship. It is not, a, it is not chance that the American publishing industry, as we know it today, was all but born in 1959, 19, or 1859, 1860. That's not chance. These folks, if you don't know this, a great many Americans at the outbreak of the Civil War knew it was a historic event. If you go back and read their letters, they're perfectly well aware that these are epic events that are going to go down in history. So the, the publishers knew this. And they, the first song, the first official Civil War song came out within a week or two of the firing on Fort Sumter. I mean, you've got to be kidding, right? No. Publishing industry owes its success to the Civil War. But your question, doesn't the music then owe itself to the publishing industry? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because unlike any time before, when George Root wrote the Battle Cry of Freedom, that piece of music spread throughout the North within five, six months. Yeah, so the success of Civil War music was dependent on the new publishing industry. The new publishing industry would not have formed were it not for the Civil War. Absolutely true, absolutely true. Congress uh, pairing of music and words in Maryland, my Maryland. But maybe that maybe that's just to us now. It seems like the, the people you know, listening, the listeners in the 19th century, didn't seem to mind this that much. But um, to us, it's incongruous. And what does that say about the about the the piece as a whole to have this kind of uh, I don't know, innocuous sounding music and then this really gory poetry paired together. What does that mean for the, the whole thing to, to us? What is, what is it saying? The, yeah, the best answer I can give would be to direct you elsewhere. There's this foolish musicologist who wrote a whole book on that stupid song. 
You go, you go read that. Um, I gave up years of my life to that stupid tune. Um, and I have, I, I'm gonna just be, I'm gonna be blunt, Gordon. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I will try and make this concise. First of all, as we've already agreed, it may not have been incongruous to their ears, okay? What I argued in the book was that Hetty and Jenny Carey, the two young ladies who picked this tune for the poem, did not know the tune as O Christmas Tree. O Christmas Tree didn't exist at that time. It existed in two other forms, O Tannenbaum, but that really hadn't made it to America yet. There were colonies of German settlers who sang O Tannenbaum, but it was not an American hymn at that point, which leaves the last version it's a piece called Lauragur Horatius. Horatius, forget my Latin. That's why I try never to say it. It was the same melody, but it was a college glee. Ah, uh, 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 but bear with me. College glee in Latin. Four part men singing in Latin. To me, that could trigger a martial image. You with me? So if Hetty and Jenny only know the song by hearing young male quartets sing it, they may have put military connotations onto it. Whereas we hear, you know, the Peanuts Christmas show. Um, that's the best answer I can give you. Um, Well, I'll tell you the biggest stumbling block I have to your question. And I'm only being half funny. I mean, I'm trying to get a laugh, but I spent years with this tune and it drove me nuts. Um, I can't get over band arrangements of it. It's in three. It's just, all, you know, I've been, I've been preaching Civil War bands will play anything and it's true and audiences love them. But the thought of a regimental band playing ba -rum -ba -bum, ba -rum -ba -bum, it's like, wow, yeah, let's go fight, you know, whoop de doo I, I can't do it. I can't get past that in my ear. So I wish I had a great answer for you. I'll oh, go ahead and ask it again. Yeah, yeah. And even, even in pieces like, you know, it's still not the most comfortable march tune um, compared to everything else they were playing at the time. I mean, that's where you go back to John's Brown Body. What a great marching tune. And then they come, you know, tripping along and playing Marilyn by Marilyn. Yeah, I have trouble with that. Interesting question. Um, gosh, because you know my knee jerk, my knee jerk act, uh, reaction answer. I, I, it almost, I, it felt like it was going to be really arrogant if I said it, so I hesitated. Um, I've spent twenty five stinking years reading letters, diaries, journals of Civil War soldiers, and so there's a part of me that says, "No, you're not going to surprise me at this point." You know, and that's what that's where all this comes from. My my whole perspective of this, and, and my students have heard me say this. I'm an archive rat. Everything I do is based on the authentic word, and I build my thoughts off that. So I feel real confident about that. 
That being said, the trend in Civil War research these days, there are two that I think apply to your answer. The first is a um, number of scholars are demanding that we start investigating the voices that have not been addressed yet. So, and this is not new if anybody's into this research, but at least it's newer. Um, you go back 20 years. I mentioned Nina Silber early in my paper. She was the first one to publish a book saying, can we stop talking about soldiers and start talking about the women at the home front? If you want, if you want to understand musical practice, hello. Um, there's been a real uh, push towards separating social class in terms of primary sources. This is kind of one of those, once you hear it, but most of the surviving documents we have are from upper class. Because the lower class you go, the less likely they are to be literate. So the point being, I may say, I've read thousands of Union and Confederate soldiers. The truth is, I've read thousands of Union and Confederate soldiers of a certain social class. So there's a whole body of literature that needs to be looked at more. There's been a ton of research on black soldiers, as you might imagine. <laughs> Native American soldiers are still getting ignored. Um, and then the next thing I would say that I tend to avoid if I'm ever giving a talk, or especially if I'm in front of Civil War people, um, there's been a real uh, return to regionalism. A lot of people are going from the macro down to the micro. So let's just talk about Savannah <laughs> for four years and you try and do a cross section of everybody at that time. And that requires pulling on new sources, things that people haven't looked at. For those of you who are interested in this sort of stuff, um, stepping outside my field for a minute and into the realm of library science, um, there's been a real period of soul searching, let's call it, um, uh, uh, in the world of archivists. Um, and it's based on what I just told you about social class. I pride myself on being a primary source dude, an archivist, or archive type of person. But what these people are pointing out is that archives are themselves segregate, seg uh, segregated, elitist, and exclusive. The only things that archives hold are things that people held on to and donated. And if you go back through the history of any archive, people submit things, right? I'd like you to, this for your archive. And I don't know if you know this, but archives turn down two things for every three they accept. So the point being, archives have the authentic voice, but it's been pre-screened. That archive actually doesn't have the voice of everyone. How's that for an answer? Thank you. Good. Does somebody have an easier one? Great question. Um, before I answer that, word of caution, some of you might now go out and read a book and there'll be somebody, a union veteran, who says, I hate Dixie, and you'll come running up to me and go, oh, you were wrong. So, all right, I know that, all right. There are two tunes. One's not gonna surprise you, one's gonna surprise everybody in this room. The one that wouldn't surprise you is the song Marching Through Georgia. Now, I don't expect y'all who don't waste your lives studying Civil War to know it, but Marching Through Georgia was a song written after Sherman sacked the city of Atlanta. And it describes it rather gleefully. This is not a song any Confederate wanted to hear. It is a song that people in Georgia still would rather not hear, all right? It's, it's very graphic in its destruction of Georgia. So no, that one never crosses lines. 
Here's the weird one for you, folks. And by the way, Austin, or no, whoever asked the question, how did I get into this? This is actually one, I hadn't thought about this, but here's an answer back for you. All the stuff I've read, you can't not help but watch which tunes cross over and which ones don't. And it's funny when I find a union band playing Dixie or whatnot. As I started compiling these notes, I found there was one tune Southerners were incredibly hostile to, incredibly hostile, and you'll never guess what it was, Yankee Doodle. Of, they, they tried to co-opt the Star Spangled Banner for a while. They wrote new lyrics. The lyrics stunk, so they gave up. They co-opted John Brown's body. They, you know, they did all this stuff. Yankee Doodle, they didn't want to hear it. It was, it was dissed in the newspapers. For whatever reason, Yankee Doodle was a real sore spot for Southerners. And I, I have no idea why. I mean, an, an old mentor of mine said, hello, look at the title, Yankee. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, but you think there's a little bit more to it than just the title of the tune. Yeah, Yankee Doodle Man and Marching Through Georgia. Those are the first two that come to mind. That was an easy one, yeah. I appreciate that very much, Paula, thank you. I only have two thoughts in response. First of all, I wish I got royalties. <laughs> Second of all, ain't it a hoot that I'm not doing it now? Now I'm talking about veteran songs. It's like, oh well, guess the band thing didn't work out. <laughs> uh, that it, we out of here? Happy Groundhog's Day. Thank you so much for giving up your valuable time to come here. I truly appreciate it.